time for that touchdown of 102 hours, 45 minutes, 42 seconds, and we will update that. Eagle Houston, uh, you loaded R2 wrong. We want 10254. I think it was one of the most dramatic moments I've ever shared, Alistair. It, Buzz Aldrin did that superb job of talking us down, the one foot forward, one foot yaw, one foot. And finally, the, the first complete sentence spoken on the moon was that of Neil Armstrong. He said, Tranquility Base, Eagle has landed. We don't expect much in the way well, of a at this moment, the, the crew are uh, running period and have gotten the state uh, to remain on the lunar surface for at least one command and service module revolution. At this moment the crew are trying to check the angle at which their spacecraft is standing on the moon. All this spacecraft systems continue to look very good to us here on the ground. Tranquility Base, Houston, we ex recommend you exit P-12, over. P-12 is a self-checking mode for the computer. This is one of the vital electronics elements that could sustain some possible damage, however slight the shock. The other one is the inertial measuring unit, which is a very finely tuned piece of uh, gear that, that must function. All their early moments will be dedicated to finding out if, if the fidelity is, is good in those pieces. Those pieces are in fact essential, of course, for getting off the moon again. Incidentally, all the time that that spacecraft was landing, 
a, a film camera was automatically recording the final descent onto the lunar surface through one of the windows. We look forward very much to getting that film back to, to Earth shortly. At the moment, the crew are looking through their windows in addition to checking their instruments and systems for getting off the moon, and they're trying to work out their precise position on the ground in relation to the maps that they carry inside the vehicle. Alistair, do you have any notes? I clocked it at 17 minutes without regard to seconds. As touchdown. Oh, yeah. I don't have the second. Uh, uh, it seems like a very long final phase. Uh, the auto targeting was taking us right into a football field sized uh, football field sized crater uh, with a large number of uh, big boulders and rocks uh, for about a one or two crater diameters around it. And it required a gun and C sixty six and fly it manually over the rock field uh, to find a reasonably good area. Roger, we copy. It was beautiful from here. Tranquility, over. Now we'll get to the details of, uh, of what's around here, but it looks like a collection of just about every variety of uh, shape.
down on the moon at this moment, Armstrong should be switching on the radar, the rendezvous radar on the lunar bug, ready to track Michael Collins as he comes overhead some 60 odd miles above in the command ship. Collins, in his turn, is trying to position the lunar bug precisely on the moon's surface in relation to his maps. And Buzz Aldrin is priming the computer, the computer and robot brain that would help the lunar bug to... Well, we've just gotten a report uh, from the telecom here in Mission Control that uh, lab systems look good after that landing. Uh, we're about 26 minutes now from loss of signal uh, from the command module. Alistair, by one note of interpretation, I thought I heard Neil say that he sat down in a uh, bowl about three times the size of a football field. That would, for you English listeners, 300 yards long by about 150 yards wide. Your football fields are a little larger, I think. But the, the one he had reference to, I'm sure, was only 100 yards long. So they do seem to be, rather surprisingly, sitting in a very large crater. I think most people had expected them to come down on a completely flat area of the moon. But by the sound of the mass of different rocks, there's going to be a rich harvest for the scientists back on Earth. Some of those scientists, 12 of them in fact, waiting in British laboratories to receive some of those samples. In about the angle that we've heard, four and a half degrees, that's a safe angle. Oh, it's quite safe. Uh, up to 15 before we start to worry too much. In about two, two minutes' time, the crew will close the shutters over their windows to cut down the strong sunlight. Uh, the guy with Another minute, they will take off their helmets and gloves. You can imagine their excitement on the way down. They got at least three program alarms. This calls for a, a loud buzzer to go off inside the cabin in a flashing light. And when you're trying to guide yourself down the surface of another world, I imagine it would be spine tingling to say the least. All all were forced along, false alarm. Uh, you might be interested to know that, uh, I, I don't think we notice any difficulty at all in adapting to what they can do. Uh, it seems, uh, uh, immediately natural to move in, uh, in this environment. Roger, tranquility, we copy, over. Optimistic sound? Neil Armstrong reporting, uh, no difficulty adapting to the one-sixth gravity of the moon. Window is a relatively level plane created with uh, a fairly large number of uh, uh, craters of the, of the uh, five to 50 foot variety and uh, some ranges, uh, small 20, 30 feet high, I would guess, and uh, literally thousands of little one and two foot uh, craters around the area. We see some uh, angular blocks up uh, several hundred feet in front of us that are probably uh, two feet uh, in size and have uh, angular edges. Uh, there is a hill in view uh, just about uh, on 
the ground track uh, ahead of it, typical to estimate, but it might be uh, a half a mile or uh, a mile. Roger, Trank, Tranquility, we copy, over. Oh, it looks a lot better than it did yesterday at that very low sun angle. It looked rough as a cob, and... That was Mike Collins, and I think... Uh, it really was rough. Mike, uh, over the, uh, the targeted landing area, it was uh, extremely rough, cratered, and uh, large numbers of rocks that were probably some, uh, many larger than five or ten feet in size. programs which the crew are being told to feed into their mini computer, the smallest computer that was in the world, now out of the world, and these programs are absolutely necessary to permit an emergency blast off from the moon's surface at any time. The words e-memory dump refer to clearing the memory of the computer ready for fresh information to be punched into it by the crew on the buttons in their cockpit. It sounds like they, they landed about four miles beyond the precise point, which is pretty good for government work. <laughs> We'd all say our men that they're done safely. You see the moon over London there. Uh, we don't actually see the astronauts on it. Uh, in the old days, they might have been expected to wave a flag. <laughs> Alistair, there were a number of uh, obs observatories on Earth watching with telescopes for any sign of the landing. They hoped they might see. They hoped they might see a dust cloud. Nine zero two three four four seven. Roger, copy, tranquility. Gravity aligned looks a good. Uh, we see you recycling. Well, no, I was trying to get time uh, 1665 out, uh, and uh, somehow it proceeded on to the uh, 622 before I could do a uh, verse 32 enter. Uh, I want to log a time here, and then I'd like to know whether you want me to proceed on the torquing angles or to. Uh, uh, Go back and uh, re-enter again before charging over. Right, but stand by. This is quite a wait, Paul, but I guess it's all for a very good reason. We haven't heard whether they are in fact sufficiently excited and feel sufficiently fit 
Uh, we have heard that they're not too troubled by the loss of gravity, but they might in fact go out early and walk on the moon earlier than the schedule. Well, really, I've, I've heard no comment on that, but of course that wasn't ruled out. I suspect this crew will stick to the flight plan. They'll take their rest. That was a hazardous letdown, let's face it. They've landed in a field which I, if I read their comments properly, is a bit more indifferent than they'd hope. Houston, we'd like you to recall P-57 and run through the gravity line one more time, over. Now this, this is a program that tests their inertial measuring unit to test the fidelity of it. Was it hurt? they might have started that program and dumped it, got an alarm, so they're starting it a second time, okay, I guess. Okay, uh, we've tried both of those. The circuit breaker is in, and when I reset uh, the, uh, put it in reset, I get 9020440. When I release it, now I get 9020449. I'm going to cycle uh, the uh, circuit breaker. Roger. I cycled the circuit breaker and got all nine. And uh, it will not now reset from all nine. Roger. Well, this is not exactly what they should be seeing, so we'll, we'll have to watch this development. There are other modes available, but this, this isn't the happiest one in the usual it suggests that something is a little out of alignment in the okay. in the organization there they very carefully check they know their circuit breakers are in place they know they've entered the proper program at least twice i'm sure both of them watch the entry key and uh, they're not getting the readout they should It's not necessarily a great big panic mode, but it should have come along a little smoother than this. This is possibly guard on landing. It's got to be a possibility. This small computer, of course, is the brains of the entire lunar landing vehicle. It measures less than one cubic foot. It's situated between the two pilots. The local surface is very comparable to that we observe from orbit at this sun angle, about 10 degrees sun angle or that nature. It's pretty much without color. It's gray and it's very white. Peter, that the uh, rock underneath has been affected by the engine, uh, where they're not the burned out grey interior, but that the samples will be picked up may not be very perfect now. Well, uh, this, was one, this is one of the key things that they have to look out for. They've been told to check the contamination of the rock and the dust around it that was caused by that hot rocket exhaust blasting downwards as they cushioned their landing. Uh, they will measure how far this browning or staining extends and then they will attempt to bring back some of those samples 
and some samples from further afield, which should be virgin moon, uncontaminated by rocket exhaust. Standing by for a go on the Agnes line and a lunar line over. Stand by. Now this word Ags, which keeps cropping up, stands for Abort Guidance System. And it is in fact the little midget brain which guides the moonship upwards if it has to blast off from the moon in an emergency. In a few moments, Neil Armstrong will begin checking all the camera equipment aboard. Peter, you heard the uh, second time Charlie Duke, the Capcom there in Houston, advising him to go ahead and... That's Armstrong. Roger, we're reading uh, somewhat different than that. Stand by. Uh, apparently there's an error in instrumentation. The crew is not concerned at all about the build-up and pressure, but the pressure could build up. Descent fuel will be vented into the vacuum outside to get rid of it. It would present a hazardous situation if they tried to light the ascent engine and lift Great off the, Houston, the, the lower stage, which would be full of fuel. Over. quantities of fuel and other <coughs> consumables that are aboard the moonship are automatically measured and the information radioed automatically to ground control at Houston and a separate set of instruments show the crew these levels of propellant and other substances and this of course does often lead to some confusion where ground control get one set of readings and the pilots themselves get another and sometimes there is a little alarm until somebody realizes that a computer or an electronic switch in some position has accounted for this discrepancy. At the moment, they are trying to sort out very carefully precisely how much fuel there is left in the moonship, precisely whether the computer is working satisfactorily and whether they are in a good, safe condition to blast off from the moon should they have to do so. These are, these are questions which are being uh, asked everywhere now, aren't they? I think it was right to hear everything from a long time before they got down to quite a long time after, as they said it, uh, without adding our own congratulations and applause. The first words from uh, Armstrong, uh, from Tranquility Base. Buzz, good show, fantastic. These are the words. Paul, your feeling is that so far as the actual situation of the lunar module, it is all right. They can lift off. They're not tilted too far one way or the other. Uh, I would say yes. They, they have this program alarm condition in, in adjusting the inertial measuring unit, but they have two other sources which they could use if a liftoff was necessary, the abort guidance computer and the, uh, the primary guidance computer. The inertial measuring unit is a very, very delicate balance wheel, which is like the three little bones in our ears, which provide us. It's our inertial measuring unit. Uh, Peter, do you think these communications are, in fact, quite good? We're 
hearing them very loud and clear, even though they're down among all those stones, which caused some trouble in previous flights. Yes, uh, sir, I think that compared with the communications that we had from Snoop Snoopy three months ago, when it was 50,000 feet above the moon, these communications are beautiful, and it bodes well for tomorrow morning's walk on the moon, that we may well get some, if not good, clear pictures, good, strong signals. I hope we get good, clear pictures. The thing that has impressed me about uh, the conversations that we've had since touchdown is that despite these apparent small problems in the instruments and in the readings, the crew has nonetheless carried out its prime objective, which is looking out of the windows and observing as fast as possible every scrap of information that they can detect on the moon's surface, so that if they had to go at any second, they could still come back and tell a very valuable, scientific, scientif scientifically valuable, as well as interestingly human story. They are enormously professional. This is the first thing one must say about them. They are. I think that uh, they have shown what uh, Paul predicted as a crew, that they don't say very much, but they do perform like automatons. We haven't had any great jokes. We have had some pleasant remarks like eagle has wings, but nothing really very human about them so far, but they have performed absolutely beautifully as test pilots. Now, Peter, what in particular is wrong at the moment? Is it that computer which isn't working right? Is anything else that we know in difficulty? At the moment, there doesn't seem to be anything beyond this small guidance system which combines a computer with a kind of gyroscope which may be slightly out of alignment or may not be. It may be a false reading. This is just something which we'll have to work out. But in any case, as Paul said, there are two backup systems which they could use if they did have to get off the moon in a hurry. And I think that it could be accounted at this moment as a safe landing with only a very small technical hitch that they will probably clear up in a matter of minutes. Now, Paul, when Armstrong set off, he said there was a 20% possibility that something would go wrong. How would you say possibility was now, after they got down in this condition? Well, I, I would say happily that he was wrong about the landing phase, and I think we're just going to get along swimmingly now. You're not concerned about this uh, particular problem? Certainly not. In, in, the, in overall, in balancing the two, I, I would say that the, the landing has to be the far more difficult maneuver. Now, Paul, uh, what was it actually like inside that uh, capsule, do you imagine? You mentioned when these alarm signals went. Would chaps be able to hear themselves think when this happened? I'll bet that, uh, I would imagine that would be, uh, just scared them out of their skin, <laughs> really. Uh, and, and Armstrong, as seasoned a pilot as he is, indicated that. I think they had reference to three alarms. I think Aldrin showed himself to be superbly cool and collected by just keeping that chatter up. I admired that. It, uh, Houston kept on saying to them, you look good, you look good. And disregard that last program alarm. Well, that's hard to do. When that bell goes off, that means trouble. That's the way the system was designed. <laughs> Incidentally, Alistair, you might just uh, care to see where that alarm is located on the instrument panel just in front of the pilot's eyes. It's called Master Alarm there. It's just one of the many reasons why you'd never find me as close to that. I'd be too alarmed, I think, even to hear it before it came off. Well, now, that is the situation. They are down. They are safe. So far as we know, they can get off safely. Things are being checked out. We hope they'll walk soon. David. Alistair, thank you very much indeed for keeping us so well informed. You are being too modest. You're a natural astronaut, I'm sure of it. There's so much here that we want to say. But first of all, we want to listen, if we can, to... They've understood something that I don't. I'll ask them in a moment. But we're going straight away now to 10 Downing Street to hear the Prime Minister. I've just been broadcasting on the American TV network, and I'm sure I was speaking for all of us in this country who've just seen this incredible historic occasion on our television set, when I said that our first feeling, the first feeling of all of us, is heartfelt relief that this very dangerous part of the mission uh, has been safely accomplished. And all of us are equally anxious that all the other dangerous parts of the mission, they will come through equally successfully. But I'm sure it's right, too, to say that our other great feeling is one of admiration. Admiration first for the way in which this has been planned and conceived, 
It's a job which is involved, which is incorporated, all the discoveries of all the mathematicians and physicists and all the space experts and the computer experts right from the moment when all these sciences began. But equally, we pay tribute to the central planning of this operation by the American Space Agency. But above all, I think, we give our admiration to the heroism and bravery and fortitude, not only of the three gallant men who are out there tonight, but those who've gone before them of all nations, those who risked their lives, some have lost their lives, so that this great achievement could be recorded tonight. And equally their families, who've had the real anxiety and who tonight must have watched that successful touchdown with a sense of massive relief. I think even before uh, we uh, send our congratulations to the uh, American president, the American people, and all who played their part in this, I think the one thing we want to express now is our deep wish for a safe return to Earth at the end of what has been almost the most historic scientific achievement in the history of man. I think... Our thanks to the Prime Minister. We shall, in fact, be returning to 10 Downing Street for a somewhat different sort of programme on next Friday night. Now, there's lots of uh, reactions that we want to get now in the next few minutes, but uh, first of all, Alistair, I wonder for those of us who've been piecing together the last 60 or 90 minutes, I wonder if you could give a lightning summary of what, to you as you listened in, and perhaps heard a little more even than we heard, would you in just a few seconds summarise for us what were the... What was the pith of it all for you? Well, what was in my mind, David, was first how excellently it seemed to be going off until they were down and we heard this other news. But secondly, that this is just the beginning for men. It isn't perhaps just the scientific uh, importance of this mission. It is that this is just the beginning and men are going to go on from here, perhaps in 10 years' time. We'll be in a similar situation watching them somewhere near Mars. That's what I thought. Thank you very much indeed, Alistair. I just got a message that I gather that on some, for some reason, the technical quality that on the picture of the Prime Minister that you just heard, that we had to take the picture owing to interference on the line from this vast Idafor screen here, so that the picture may not have been quite as clear as you would have wished, if it wasn't. You may not have noticed, but we gather that's what we had to do, so we thought we'd tell you, so do not adjust your set. Uh, thank you, Alistair, very much indeed for that uh, for that summary. And now I wonder, I was talking earlier this today to some seven and eight year old children who were absolutely thrilled by what's going on here. And we've got a group of them who've been up for a late night who are uh, waiting for us up north. I wonder if they're still wide awake there and with us. What was the reaction that you, all of you, had to this? Can you? Andrew. Well, I thought it was great watching it in the time. You know, watching it break away and coming down, you know, it looked great, just coming down from the sky. <coughs> yeah, I liked it. <laughs> Kirsten, what about you, Kirsten? It was a fantastic achievement, I think. You going to go on, Dave? Yeah. Soon? <laughs> well, um, well, I wouldn't miss the opportunity, but I'd be scared if I did go. What about you, John, from Ledley? Um, well... If I did golf, I would feel very scared. Really? Yeah, I reckon. What about Jonathan Full Tom? Well, if I went up, I wouldn't really like to go up, though. No. Like most boys say they would. I wouldn't like to go up, really. I'd like to have um, some kind of an, another job. I wouldn't like to be an astronaut. Oh, dear. No, no, no ambitions here. Vicky, what about Vic Victoria Baker? Age seven and four days, she tells me. What do you think about it all? That's what she thinks about it. <laughs> let's, let's sneak over here, find Julie Hull, who is nine, according to my memory. Julie, what do you think of it all? Mm. Has that been the first woman on the moon? No. You wouldn't, why not? It's too scaring. Too scaring? Well, they, they've proved it's not scaring at all, haven't they? Still too scaring at the age of nine. What about, is it Janet down here? Mm. What about you, Janet? Do you think it's good? Yes. Yeah. Enjoy watching it. Yeah. Do you like to go? 
No. Nobody wants to go. Any ambition for him to go to the moon one day? Yes, You would. What do you think of it? Great. I'd like to go. I'd like to go. Soon? Yeah. Pack a bag. You're off. Pack a bag. You're off tomorrow. <laughs> what about Rosalind? Down here, Rosalind Baker, sister of the other Bakers we, we've talked to. What do you think of it, Rosalind? <laughs> what do you think you'd find up there if you went, anyway? Rocks. Rocks. With moon written all the way through it, I've no doubt. <laughs> is it they'll no, no find that and nothing else tomorrow morning? <coughs> I don't know. Don't know. You're going to wait for tomorrow morning and find out that, how about you? Yeah. All right, Gary, this is his house. After all, you're all guests in his house. What do you think of it, Gary? It's great. I think it's a great achievement for them to get to the moon. Do you like to have gone? Not really, no. You don't reckon you're an astronaut? No. What do you think they'll find tomorrow morning? I don't know, really. I don't know what to expect. Think they'll sink Anything. in the ground? No. You reckon not? No. Think they'll get back safely? Yes. Do you hope so? Yes. All right. Vicky wants to say something. There's a hand going up. I hope you're not going to go to the little room. Come on. What do you want to say? I, I think they could meet a horrible creature. Oh, I hope not. You think they will? I think there are no horrible creatures up there. I do. You do? Well, we'll find out tomorrow morning, shall we? Who else has got anything to say? Somebody here has got something to say. Pushing a sister, having a fight. <laughs> Karen, you're one of the oldest here. Thirteen. I think you're the oldest of the lot, in fact, nearly as old as me. Would you like to go? I don't know, really. I don't think so. Because, you don't know what you're going to, you know, find or, you know, take less courage. You know, take less courage. Take less courage. Yeah. Do you think it's been like any of the stories you used to read when you were when you were a smaller girl? Um. Is it like is it like you thought it would be like a quiet night just watching it on television? Do you think it was something something different or something less exciting? No, I thought it. I thought it'd be a exciting, because, I mean, nobody's done it before, and you never know what's going to happen next. Very good. What do you think you should plant up there? <coughs> to leave? Plant. What do you think you should leave up there, to show that they were the first men there? Oh, I don't know. Flag or something. A flag or something? Oh, no, They're no. putting an American flag up there, I think. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, nobody wants to be an asteroid here in Manchester. Thank you. Oh, yes, they do. Ah, oh, Vicky wants Ah, oh, two or three want to be now. Yes, ah, oh, they all want to be astronauts. Now, they've changed their minds. Thank you very much indeed, children. They did pop back to you in London. Thank you very much indeed up there in Manchester, and uh, thank you to our young people there, too. Many thanks. Uh, here in the studio, we've got a number of people who, in rather differing ways, have got reasons to be glad for the successful landing on the moon. All of us here in the audience, I want to talk to our leading experts here too, but all of us here in the studio, we didn't know how to respond when it happened. Everybody, people applauded and everything, and that's the response we all had here, gratitude and, and delight. But before we come to someone in the audience who's got a more specific reason almost for gratitude and delight than almost anybody else in Britain, let me just turn here, because Kenneth Gatlin said a fascinating thing to me as he was sitting down a moment or two ago. You said that if it had been robot control all the way through, it might not have been successful. Could you? Yes, uh, David, I think that um, from what we had from the commentary of uh, the astronauts, they found some fairly rugged territory at the end of their flight path. And if this had been a purely robot spacecraft, um, it may not have got down as successfully as uh, Armstrong did indeed flew it down. Uh, human judgment here has uh, been a triumph, I think. And now, what about you? Herman Bondi has joined us, the Director General of the European Space Research Organization. What's your reaction at this moment? Well, I'm thrilled, I'm very, very pleased. In the last moments, I thought, were extremely tense. Yeah. Just before touchdown, that was the moment when things might have gone wrong. Well, they didn't really go wrong. And, uh, that's not James Ray. Well, I, I, the thought going through my mind is that those children of 9, 10, 11, seem to take this for granted, you know. And I wonder if, when they're 50, they'll realize they've lived through an epoch-making event. I mean, perhaps one of the most important events in the history of man, and, and the, the forerunner of all sorts of other things that are going to come from this. It's like being present when the Wright brothers first went up, only much more so. Right. 
Let me say, before we go over to our audience here, let me add one other thing too, incidentally, that we're listening to everything that's being said from space at the moment, and anything that's really that you ought to hear or you, we think you would like to hear, we shall bring to you straight away. So we're listening to that at all times over at ITN in Kingsway. We're waiting too, of course, at the moment for the decision, the decision to walk and the decision when to walk. Will it be early tomorrow morning? Or, uh, well, it's going to be early tomorrow morning, but will it be early tomorrow morning at 7 or disgracefully early tomorrow morning at 3 a.m.? We're waiting for all of these decisions. We're waiting for more of their impressions, and we'll bring them to you the moment they come through. But one man who really has an extra reason for being grateful is Mr. Threlfall in the front row of the audience. And Mr. Threlfall, will you say to me, tell me your special reason for delight? I just won ten thousand pounds from William Hill. <laughs> Mr. Crawford has just won ten thousand pounds from William Hill. Now, when did you? <laughs> if there's one person who doesn't need applause tonight, <laughs> it's Mr. Hill. <laughs> no, but congratulations. Uh, when did you place the bet? April 1964. April 1964. And with us, welcome. Happy Joe. Your name's Brooks. Mr. Brooks from William Hill. That's right. Uh, now, uh, was there any doubt when this? bet was placed that it would be taken? Oh no, Mr. Threlfall wrote to us and asked us what odds we would offer. We offered him a thousand to one and we, we received a reply from him very shortly saying he'd like to have ten pounds on it. Very good. Have you got the cheque with you tonight? I have, yes. Would you like, in the presence of mil millions, to show that uh, William Hill pays up? <laughs> <laughs> Being the biggest bookmaker in the world, it's not an entirely new experience for us. I thought there'd be a commercial somewhere. <laughs> there it is. Uh, there is the great cheque. Take it there, how about that? 10,000 pounds for Mr. D.E. Threlfall, plus uh, 10 pounds return of stake as well. Mr. Threlfall, congratulations. And no tax. And no tax. Thank you very much indeed, and congratulations. Thank you very much. And it's also a great joy to see alongside Miss, will you welcome please my favorite suffragette, <laughs> Miss Lillian Linton. Welcome. <laughs> Last time you were with us, it was such a delight. You were, you were comparing the days of Tariq Alley with your days, yes. and uh, the things you did, the things you did in queue, right? Well, I did one thing in queue. Yes, at least I was accused of it. I was never found guilty. Uh, just remind the folks what you were accused of doing in queue. Well, I was accused with another girl of burning down queue pavilion. Oh, there it was. <laughs> I'm not saying whether I did it or not. <laughs> I just, we, we just wanted you to come along because it's so good to see you. And also to just say, I wonder what your reaction is to the scene. Well, my reaction to this last event will, I'm sure, be exactly like everybody else's. I'm exceedingly glad that they have succeeded. And I'm sure they'll succeed all the rest of the way. But I'm not in any way surprised. They wouldn't have undertaken it if the human brain hadn't been able to think out the way to do it successfully. Of course, we know there are always dangers, there are always possibilities that something will go wrong, but I didn't expect anything to go wrong. What's and I don't think they did either. And what's the first invention you can remember? Oh, I don't in know. In your childhood, there were, there were these incendiary bombs that you used, of course. We, we didn't <laughs> use incendiary bombs, at least I didn't. What did you <laughs> maybe <laughs> use or not <laughs> use? Well, uh, what we used was fire lighters and paraffin, if we wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember much about the invention. You see, I was too busy being a suffragette yeah. to think about anything else that was happening. I do remember the early motor cars, of course. You do? And uh, being taken in one right down to the south of England so that I could go across to France on one of the many occasions when the police were after me. Well, I got across to France. Really, you escaped, did you? Oh, yes, Well, yes. there are no I police waiting outside the studio tonight, so you're <laughs> absolutely safe. From the age of firelighters and paraffin, thank you, Lily, mm. and congratulations, Mr. Threlfall. We've got to take a short break. We'll be back with more reactions with our trip around Britain to places like Trafalgar Square and the Revolution and to hear the latest news on what the astronauts have decided to do and when they've decided to do it. Back with Man on the Moon in just a moment.